authority has, um, well, a, a, a disabled person has been given the okay to take a local authority to court because of its failure to um, comply with the wellness principle in the Care Act. And this is around um, austerity and cuts to budgets and capping of services. Um, but it's partly about independent living and disabled people. And you've talked a lot about vulnerability, as if anyone who comes into contact with these services is automatically vulnerable. That's not so. Sometimes it's the services that make people vulnerable. And what my question is about is how will you promote and ensure that uh, the disabled people who do need independent living support um, I think the word social care is a big diversion in this kind of arena. The people who need independent living support, how will they get it? Because they're not getting it now. Andy, okay, and, well, and feel free to um, have a go. Yeah, at, uh, it, it, it touches <laughs> on. Uh, it, it will touch on what, what Ivan. Um, uh, we'll we'll I've get a right of reply. We're going to go on all day, aren't we? I mean, I just let me come back to you. I mean, you, I praise you because we did it together. Uh, so it was a bit odd when you, you kind of then turn it back. You and I both at that time had concerns that this policy was going wrong, and you did. You, you backed me up, and that's why I, I mentioned it to say that we both uh, did that. But when you say you were sitting in the office making the first plan for you the do. integration you of do. health and social care, well, you used to sell it as the first plan for personal budgets. Now I'm not saying they're not. They're, well, putting that's, people first. I, I don't think putting people. There, it is not clear to me. Putting, Put, people. putting people first. Yeah. So let me just talk about the integration that. of health and social. Let me just talk about it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that, the key reform of that was personal budgets. Now, I'm not saying I'm against them necessarily, because it brings me on to the question you know, that you asked me. Uh, pardon? You I could have sworn you did. No, no I didn't. Well, I, I'll try and answer it. Um, personal budgets do not definitely take you towards a more integrated service. They could actually take you to a highly fragmented uh, service. Personalisation is what I would say is what we want within the system, person-centred care. Vulnerability was in relation to frail elderly people that I was talking about and a different model of care uh, for them. Person-centred care is all about giving individual support to people, starting in their own home, fitting it to their life and what enables them to be active and to live as a full as life as they want to. It doesn't have to come through the form of a personal budget. Personalisation doesn't, isn't solely restricted uh, to that uh, mechanism. And that's the way I want to, to build things. Person-centred care, not patient-centred uh, care. That is because of the way we reform the money is truly uh, preventative. And the reason why this is so important is, you know, Ivan is right. There is, I'm not unrealistic about all these ideals. There is a real crisis going on in the NHS. I said that at the very beginning. What the biggest single challenge the mayor will face, the single biggest challenge, is how do you get pressure off A&E? How do you make hospitals work better immediately? That is the single biggest challenge you'll face. And my answer to that is what I'm describing. If you support people better in their own homes, you will then reduce pressure on A. You will reduce visits to A&E. You will reduce time spent in hospital beds. That is the reform that I'm doing. And Ivan mentioned that, you know, Ivan and Tony have questioned my argument about bringing social care uh, into the NHS. Well, let me answer again that point. Ivan said it's taking social care out of local government. Mm -hmm. The provision is not Ivan. If you look across so all of... Said, you said that's let, let me just answer the point. But if you, you look at you. all of the councils of Greater Manchester, they've transferred their staff into these domiciliary, private domiciliary areas. They're not in local government anymore. There would be some residual, but they are largely privatised. And actually the worst form of privatisation, I would say. Companies that pay staff less than the minimum wage because they don't pay them the travel time between their 15 minute visits they put them on zero hours contracts i haven't challenged me rightly how to pay for it well the first thing you do is put some stability beneath them give them a proper contract for god's sake don't make them how can you if you don't have basic security in your life because you're on a zero hours contract how on earth are you going to pass security on to a vulnerable person in your care bring those people into the team the role for local government in my view should be as the lead commissioner, the single commissioning voice, working with the experts in the CCGs, but in the end, the lead commissioner in any borough, responsible for that year of care budget that I talked about. Commissioning from 
a lead NHS integrated care organisation, which will be a partnership, a collaboration of the NHS organisations. That's the model. You can disagree with it, absolutely fine. But it's a model I've given huge thought to as Health Secretary, as Shadow Health Secretary. Will it solve everything? No, because there is still massive underfunding, as the question said, in adult social care. And in the end, this is preparatory to saying the country needs to do a major reform of social care funding in the way that I've always advocated. And it needs to be paid for, not through local taxation anymore, through, through national taxation uh, in the same way that the NHS is paid for, and a big reform in that, in that area. But anyway, those were the points that I, I wanted to uh, respond to. Thank you very much. Tony, do you have a, a, a penny worth to put into this argument? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 will, I will come specifically to what, to what you address. I just do want to come on to this issue around the more, the more general uh, area of social care. But, Andy, Maybe but, you could talk amongst yourselves and then I could ask my question yeah, again. Uh, <laughs> fine, fine. It's, it's, I mean, but these are important issues. I mean, look, Andy, the, the, the reason, what I would say with social care, because this touches on actually access for people uh, with disabilities as well. I mean, you may be right that the term social care isn't always helpful. Um, I agree with lots of what you said, but the reality is this, is what we've got at the moment, what we've always had is a, is a system where we put people into the system, not, the, not wrapping the system around people, and that applies to provision for people with disabilities as well. And that's one of the things that goes wrong. Yes, it's underfunded at the moment. Um, one of the things that we do know is that if you begin to look at things like the living wage and campaign for the living wage, and say that that should be part of the strategy with respect to, um, to, to social care, you begin to transform the way people will stay, because people who are paid better stay in the job. It means we can train them more easily. It means we can change the, ch the life chances of those that they care for. What I don't agree with, it, actually, is the idea that it should be the hospital that delivers the integration between social care and the individual hospitals there for a specific purpose. That's the whole ambition is to get people out of the hospital. It should be driven very differently by the hospital, maybe by the GPs, but certainly um, within a community-based framework. And that's where we disagree, and that's where actually the local authorities can't be taken out of this equation. Um, local authorities are a really important part because, you know, one of the things we've got in the Great Manchester Devolution uh, deal, with all its, its defects, is, is it's not top down. It won't be the mayor coming in and telling people I'm the lead commissioner. It won't work that way. It is a partnership between the local authority and the NHS. The NHS has a lock on this. The local um, democratic local government has a lot in that. That's really important as a guarantor of, of, of people's life chances. And that gives us the opportunity, we're making that partnership work, um, to begin to deliver. Actually, the point you made about this is all about the future, it's not about the future. We're taking competition down. You know, the two hospitals, the legacy of what the last Labour government did and, and the, the reforms that this government, the lands of the reforms that built on that, we've got, actually, just one example, two hospitals in Greater Manchester. <coughs> Compete, competing to build a hybrid theatre. We need two across Greater Manchester. There's one already in, the, in central Manchester. We don't need two more. Actually, because we've got people around this table you, you're knocking at, we say, no, you can't do that. You can't compete anymore. You can't see this as your little glory project. We'll plan the strategic framework of what Greater Manchester and the people of Greater Manchester need. And you, the service providers, will fit round that, and that's the right way of doing it. In terms of, um, of, of the, the specific question, I've got, I've got to come to this in enough some time as well. There are a huge range of issues you raise. I mean, actually, one of the, one of the problems, I mean, I, I'm not against this legal challenge, by the way, but there is an issue, because ironically, they will take particular local authority to court. The problem with this lies with central government funding, uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's central government that we really ought to be facing that kind of challenge and that's something that we've got well, to say being talked about, isn't it? But we've got to say so politically and that, that's that's part of the, of, the, of the real issue. Because access to services that fit the needs of the individual um, have to be funded. Um, but we have to begin to, to make that transformation where we're saying actually what we've got to do is um, and this is where I agree with Andy actually on personalised budgets, I think you're right on that Andy. I think personalised budgets leaves vulnerable people sometimes and some people are vulnerable who don't have the the, the, the background to make those personal choices actually subject to the, to the passing snake oil salespeople. Um, we need a better system than that. Um, we need a system that is there to work with people in terms of, of their needs. But we principally say, look, we're there to empower the individual to wrap those services around those individuals, not to wrap the individual to those services. Okay.
just to deal directly with your question, then I'll deal with one or two of the broader points. Look, there is a, I think there's a big philosophical divide, and we should be honest with people here. I disagreed with the new Labour choice mantra. I don't believe that choice, in, in terms of public services, leads you to where you want to go. What I do believe, however, is that people should have maximum control over their own lives. And I'm afraid that there are some people who believe that the Labour Party should be about paternalistic, top-down services and we'll look after you and care for you. And I find that offensive. I think many disabled people want to be treated as equal citizens and they want to have maximum control over their own care, their own support and their own lives. Personal budgets are one way of giving them that control. They're not the only way. There's person-centred planning, uh, there's, a, there's, alloc there's identifying very clearly the amount of money that's available to be spent on, with you on your care and support, and you determine where that care and support uh, comes from. I don't get it. You don't get any. But, but the principle of people who are... Vo First of all, there are some people who have dementia, who are very frail, who need caring for and looking at them. And the primary objective there needs to be dignity. You go on a queue at NHS wards and you look at the way older people are often treated, it shocks me, it horrifies me. If anyone has had an elderly mum or an elderly dad or a grandparent, we need to do something about that. That's not about clinical care, that's about dignity. And by the way, we need to, to, to care enough about that. But on, on your point, it, it's rich people have always got their own budgets to go and use that budget to decide what care and support they want. But we don't want working class and people from low incomes to have that right, or people because of the fact the disabled are on lower incomes than other, uh, their fellow uh, citizens. We don't want them to have that right, because somehow we're the Labour Party. They don't have that right. I find it so offensive. I spend my life working with people with learning disabilities and mental health problems. And I said to the music station, the issue is not your label. It's your person. You have a right to be treated like any other person. Right? Now, some people with disabilities need a greater level of help and support to be able to exercise that control over their own life. Of course. They would say, over to you, you're on your own. But this is a fundamental philosophical difference. This is, this is so important. That do we believe in equality of citizenship? Do we believe that disabled people should be the recipients of our paternalistic uh, care and support? Uh, my view is that is not the kind of world, society, that I joined the Labour Party to perpetuate. I believe in equality. And equality is saying that some people, because of their disability, need some additional support to be equal citizens. And that support will vary depending on the individual set of circumstances. But you know when people in this room most feel worried about their lives? It's when it's spiralling out of control. Think about it. When you lose, are losing control of your life, it's when you most feel vulnerable and worried and anxious and insecure. Why don't we think that people with disabilities want to have maximum control over their own life? And it's not about doing things uh, on the cheap. And do you know what really upsets me? Is speak to the thousands of people who use personal social care budgets and say to them, for year after year after year, they try to get these services to be more personalised. They try to get this support to be more about their needs and less about the system. And the only thing that changed it for those people was when they got control over their own budget. How on earth can you talk about that in such a negative way? Talk to the people themselves who will tell you it was the only way in the end it transferred that transformed their lives. Are personal budgets a panacea? No. They're a manifestation of a belief that people should have maximum control of their own care and support other than people who are very frail and they need our love and our compassion and dignity. Let's be clear about it. But many, many other people want that ability to have maximum control over their life. Just two points on, on the general issues. My position on, on social care is this. Unless you do something about the pay and the status of people who work on the front line, you will never ever start to improve the quality of the service. What I've said is, if the government will not give us more money for social care, and by the way, I doubt if they will, I think we will get more money if we argue strongly enough for new mayor for the transformation of the billion pounds rather than the 450 million pounds. So my argument is if we're not going to get more money from them, we should say that we will have a preset, a hypothecated tax, be honest with the people of Greater Manchester, up to 5%, purely to ensure, you know, you know we've had the 2% mm -hmm. recently. Uh, my view is that that's nowhere near adequate enough. 
and that we should say to people, as I say, if we can't get more money out of hand, I don't think we are going to be able to get more money for revenue funding to support social care, that we should have a 5% preset. The police have a preset, the fire, the fire service have a preset. We have to be honest with people if you want people to be treated with dignity. Final point is this. If you ring up these days and you ask a, a social care commissioner local for help, the first question they ask you is your means. What means do you have? And if your means are above that level, beyond which you're not going to get their financial support, they often say, we can't help you here. You've got to navigate your way to get the nursing home for your mum or the domiciliary care agency for your dad. You're on your own. The no help here culture, I used to describe it as a minister. I would change that overnight. Look, yeah, be honest with people. Because of your means, we're not going to be able to give you financial help. But we're not going to tell you you're on your own when you're dealing with that sort of emotional crisis in your life. Or you've got suddenly uh, somebody that used to be entirely independent who's become dependent on you. So I think there's things that we need to do differently. But I think they have to be rooted in, in reality, in what you can really change and transform. It's great to have those vision and the high-minded ideas. I've got some vision and high-minded ideas of my own, but it's got to make a difference in terms of people's everyday life.